welcome to a Celtic state of mind. It's Monday, it's half past twelve, it's the Monday Club, and we're all somewhere up there because it's not just Axom, it's the multi award winning Axom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ooh. Right. First of all, to me to say congratulations, Amy. Well done on that and well done, Russell. I was in London on Thursday for it and it was quite something special. But first thing I have to say as well is a public and unreserved apology to Amy and Colin Watt, whose <laughs> names I missed out when I was name-checking everybody. Like the Oscar ceremony, you go up and you pick it up, you walk to the lectern and you say things. And I sort of started name-checking everybody and I forgot Amy and Colin. So I unreservedly apologise for that. But you were in my thoughts. My heart was in the right place. It was, now, Tony. We shall move on. Speaking of awards and winning things, Celtic got were a winning thing again on Saturday, Russell. Nice 2-0 win over Motherwell. Second away win on the spin. And also, Turnbull and Rogic played very well in this same team. They looked, all, they looked measured and in control after Jota had given them the lead. Turnbull's goal was a thing of beauty. And also the bonus of Rangers dropping points at home reduced that gap to fourth. Sorry, four points. Celtic now up to fourth. Felt like a momentum swinger on Saturday, I have to say. I was at Fir Park and they, you know, the crowd cheered when Hart scored in the last mm-hmm. minute. You know, they cheered very loudly and they, they were very appreciative of the team's efforts without it being a vintage performance. But for the first time in a long time, I thought Celtic had I could afford the luxury of not going through the gears because they were in control the minute Jota opened the score, and that's the way I felt, Russell, yourself. No, I think it's spot on, Tony. It, it, there was a moment of change. I think the thing is, we've been saying, or we've been told anyway, this has been the worst Celtic start to a league campaign in 23 years. Now, <laughs> if you told me we were going to have the worst league campaign start in 23 years, but only be four points off, off your rivals, you know, at, at this stage of the season, I would have probably took that. If, if, if it meant that, you, you know, you had to have that terrible start, but you'd only be four points, you're in touch distance right now. And I think you're absolutely right. There was a wee chink in Rangers' armour there that we've not seen, you know, in, in terms of losing a late goal. And I feel that it'll be very interesting to judge them when they've had pressure put on them. Celtic never put any... They never laid a glove on Rangers last season. Let's be completely clear on that, whilst mm-hmm. I'm not taking anything away from their achievement. But in terms of a momentum swing, you felt the fans got excited by Hart's goal more than they would have maybe a few weeks ago. You felt they went... We're now winning away from home. They're making mistakes. They're slipping up. And why not be hopeful? Why not rejoice at the time and try and you know stimulate the team, give them that belief that we think we're in a battle here for the title still, by the way. Um, I've got to praise Ange for his droll comments. I thought they were outstanding. Um, you know, I thought the premiership title was over, mate. You know, I've not even been paying attention at the table. I thought that was Russell. very, very good. I was standing feet away from him when he said that. I could have heard yeah, him yeah. at that particular moment in time. Yeah, just a, a microphone separated me from him and I smiled wryly at that and uh, I was kind of laughing as well. And I also asked him a question about this team has gears and he went into the big spiel about, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've been telling right. everything. You know, so it was my question about gears. So they kind of... You know, because I kind of noticed that I thought there was an element of control there on Saturday, which yes. would have pleased both the supporters and the manager without hitting the dizzy heights. But you know, as I wrote on the Celtic way to borrow your analogy about buses, I said the Ange bus is revving <laughs> now. You know what I mean? And when it hits, when they go through the gears and they hit full speed, then just ask Dundee and St. Martin what happens when that happens. Yeah. You know. So, Amy, I mentioned a point there about uh, Turnbull and Rogic. A lot of Celtic supporters think they can't play in the same team. Maybe dispelled a wee bit on Saturday, eh? the, the, what they brought to the table. I mean, Turnbull's goal is just stunning, but Rogic, the nature of that first goal, Kyogo wins the ball, three, one, two, three, four touches later, it's in the back of Motherwell's net. Two from Tom Rogic and uh, two from Yota. You know what I mean? So they do bring something to the table, don't they, when it works? Obviously. Absolutely. I mean, we all know that they do. Um, and it's probably just more been a frustration that 
when they were first played in the team together that it wasn't really clicking because you thought well I certainly thought you know I think that they could complement each other because you know Turnbull likes to be that little step forward um, but the they can both then drop back. You know, you look at the pass Rogic, is, that, that is a, an outstanding pass, you know, yeah. and he just opens his body up. And But he, he's got that in his locker. But then so there's Turnbull, you know, he can, he's got a, a main cross on him as well from deep. So you kind of always thought that they could complement each other. It's almost just being a bit more clashy than, than complementary right now. But I thought on, on Saturday it was a perfect example, like you say, just of, of how well they can play together because they were both so vital for them um, for both goals. Turnbull, 54 appearances, Amy, 16 goals, 11 assists. Those stats are actually pretty good. They're pretty decent. You know, when you when you look at it like that, he's he's 22. He's come in for 2.7 million quid. You know what I mean? But so, and he, he won a young player a year last year. You know, I think he's maybe just taking a wee bit of time. Do you yeah, know what I mean? I mean, he, bring, he brings a lot, doesn't he, when he's on it? He does, and I, I thought on on Saturday he played with a, with a little bit of freedom, and I was quite worried because I was I was conscious. I thought you know he was he, he loved his time at Motherwell, um, and mm. as you can you can hear from his comments afterwards, he still got mass respect for the club and everything they've done for him during the injuries, you know, because he, it was it was a really really tough time for him. So I was a bit worried as to how he would you know fair going, going back to uh, going back to Motherwell but I thought on, on Saturday it was one of his, his more complete performances I thought he, like I say he just he was playing quite freely he was you know taking that step t- maybe taking that extra touch obviously the goal is just you know he, uh, from a Motherwell perspective you're probably going you're like nobody's really touched tight um, and you know they more than anyone know what, he, what he's got in his locker so you know I'd expect that Graham Alexander and Keith Lasley they'll probably have wanted somebody to be a little bit touched tighter to him but no matter what you can't take it away from the finish because it's it's absolutely outstanding um, but yeah I just thought he was kind of kind of like the turnbull of last season when he first broke through you know and everything was just going so well everything he touched went turned to gold um, but yeah it was a, a really complete performance I felt on Saturday Amy, it went to his head because he was making up words. He said he put swaz on the ball. Yeah. <laughs> it's Z, whatever that is, you know what I mean? But uh, we'll allow him that moment of glory because he can make up words if he wants, if he's going to produce top drawer goals like that. Now, Roderick Russell, seven and a half years, he's 28, 241 games, 41 goals, 43 assists. Some of those have been absolutely and utterly sublime, as Amy said. That was... Another brilliant pass. Jota took one touch to control, one touch to finish. It, it really was quite... I, I was kind of taken by the speed of it. You know, yep. I think Kyogo won it and I think McGregor touched it onto Roderick, didn't he? And then all of a sudden, as I say, four passes, it's in the net. That's the kind of slick uh, passing movement that Ange wants, isn't it? Attacking movements that he wants. I nearly said Absolutely. it, but I won't. <laughs> I know you nearly said it. You're still been a smile there. <laughs> yeah, I've seen a bit of rip roaring in it, mate. I've seen some free free flowing. Um, I think you need to gauge Kyogo's reaction after he, yeah, sorry, Jota's reaction after he scores. Jota literally just two hands out, points at Rogic, as in to say, "Wow, that was on a plate for me, pal." Appreciate it, and I think that's another assist that can get added to his highlights reel that you were talking about, Tony. You know. Yeah. I think we were saying that his highlights reel might look pretty good. Tom Rogic will have plenty, plenty of copy oh, for that, that highlights yeah. reel now. And yeah, yeah. I think I think definitely there's been a shift in attitude from Rogic this season. I think he knows he's got a manager there who already had worked with him before, knows all his strengths, knows he's got his full back and his full trust. And you see the benefits of that. I mean, Rogic can unlock defences with split splitting passes like that. He can also score goals that only a maverick can, you know. And I think he's, I think he's entering the peak of his career right now, and we should be embracing the fact Tom Rogic is part of the starting eleven on a regular basis, and just appreciate the goodness, that, you know, the good stuff that he does. He'll never be ninety minutes a, a you know, a workhorse, a Trojan, whatever you want to call it. He'll never be that. We all kind of know that, so why labour the point? I think he's very much someone that. Enjoy the good bits about him. And yeah, I'll be honest, I was sceptical at him and Turnbull playing together when I seen that in the lineup. I thought the beat on experiment, if you like, at Pataudry had worked. And I felt very convinced that he would go with the same the same, you know, blueprint for the for, for the game at Fur Park. I feel there's similar levels of opposition, similar pressure still on. It worked at Pataudry. I expected Beaton to start, but there you go. 
that's why I'm not a football manager and paid thousands of pounds to make these calls. He got it right. You know, an assist from Rogic, a goal from Turnbull, which I'll be completely honest here, I thought was deflected. <laughs> Until you watched the replay, I was convinced that it had been deflected. The well, amount that, of that, 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 that was a swaz. That was a swaz. That was a swaz. It fit in the ball, Russell. Come on, get with the program. I know. And then when I took the swaz factor into account, Tony, I went, "Oh, that's the swaz. I get it now." So yeah, I was. Uh, I think Angel will, will have had a wee, a wee smug look in his face at one point privately, going, "Good players can play with good players." You know, Rogic and Turnbull, one got an assist, one got a goal. You know, fair play, and she deserves the credit for that decision. Trust the process, Russell. Trust the process. <laughs> now, Amy, Cameron, Carter, Vickers and Jota, they've been in the team since they were brought in and Ange seems to like them. And they are now becoming fans' favourites. You know, the they fans seem to have taken to both of them. They really like what they're doing. It's an obvious question, isn't it? Got to make these deals permanent, aren't they? They, they seem settled now at Celtic yeah. and, and seem to be enjoying it. Certainly like to think so. Um, obviously, Yotam more than, than Carter Rickers, you get to see his enthusiasm, you know, through scoring goals and, and just being the, the nature of the player that he is. Um, again, he's another one like like Turnbull on Saturday. I just thought he was always, you know, he easily could have scored a few more goals, but he was always in the right places at the right time. And I know you can be a then a little bit critical and you say like there's a few chances of them that he definitely should have been putting away but he was in the right place at the right time and he was getting in the right you know he, he again he was opening up his body you know the, the volley down into the ground he, he took it really well um, mm-hmm. you know on another day if it bounces differently or you just catch it that, that split second different then, then it's in the back of the net so He's definitely growing, um, and as he's talked about before, obviously that the highlight reel is going to be getting better and better if that sort of you know caliber of um, of goals and, and such uh, stay up. And then Carter Rickers, I think he's really building a partnership with, with Starfelt at the back. Um, perhaps maybe not the the pairing that will perhaps maybe wanted or thought. I know there's still a few people that think Stephen Welsh is a little bit hard done by, um, but you. you for so long we've talked about you know consistency at the back so if this is the partnership that Ange wants to go for and if it's Bossman and it's in week in week out then you've just kind of got to go along with it I am um, I do like Carter Vickers I really do um, and I think he would suit well to partner with Welsh I think he could really bring him on and I'd also like to think that himself and Julian will be able to partner up quite well and um, you know especially as Julian likes to stride forward sometimes he's got the height as well Carter Vickers has obviously got you know the, the, the strength and the height he's kind of um, the, the perfect build for for a for a centre half certainly in this division. So, you know, I think he's kind of the the defender we've been crying out for for a, a wee while. He's obviously he's not the finished article. Nobody really is. Um, and he is you know partial to a few little mishaps, but I think it's it's a a move that we should definitely be looking to make because I just always think you know who else could we be bringing in? You know, and I think then even then you've got to I think we've probably got the best one on our hand right now. Russell, I, I look at the pair of them, Starfield and uh, Cameron Carter, because they, they like that robust challenge, don't they? It sort of felt for them on Saturday with Tony Watt and Jordan Roberts just going toe-to-toe with them. They like that. They don't like wee tricky guys that can play around <laughs> them, you know what I mean? And they don't like too much onus uh, when they're on the ball, if you get what I mean. They just like that robust. I'll head that. I'll, I'll be a physical challenge to you, you know what I mean? And then concentrate on that. It's the minute they start to have the ball at their feet for long periods of time, you, you kind of worry because it's still no there, is it? This passing from the back, and you saw that a couple of times on Saturday, but that's nitpicking aside, you know. But I just think the two of them are, are robust defenders. They actually take art in the pride of defending, you know. Yeah, I think there's two sides to it. Do you think there's a fine line between Starfelt being over criticised and Cameron Carter Vickers being over praised at times? Well, I think yeah. what we've seen is. Cameron Carter Vickers looks to me like a player who's been at Celtic longer than what he has. And Starfelt has probably just took the amount of adapting time that really should be seen as standard. You know, because Carter Vickers has took to it, you know, so so well so quickly, it's almost made it shine a badder light oh, a badder, a worse light on Starfelt's performances because he's yeah. not taken it to it so quickly. But I think somewhere in the middle is probably the truth. I think actually Starfelt certainly isn't giving me the same panic 
attacks that he was four or five weeks ago. Cameron Carter Vickers seems to, we'll go back to the old term, Tony, he just seems to get it. You know, he doesn't seem to have many airs or graces about him in terms of, oh, I'm an EPL player or, you know, even alone at the championship, they all, you know, a lot of the players down there think they're way up higher, they're, you know, they're, they're, they think they're better than what they are. He's not came up with any sort of airs or graces. I like the, his attitude and I think you're right. Both of them seem to thrive on the the physical aspect of the SP, SPFL will definitely demand of them, which is great to see. I just think Vickers has took to it quicker than what Starfield has. But for me, right now, when Julian comes back, it'll be a, you know, I think it's a complete straight fight between Julian and Starfield for the for the jersey. But like I was saying last week, to be honest, when we, we think the squad's so depleted, when you look at the competition for the two centre-back places, and you're going Swedish international, 26 years old, player on loan from Spurs, uh, USA international, Chris Julian, £7 million signing, and the youth product, I find that quite healthy competition. I'm like, I, I would like to think they'll all be pushing each other on. You'd yeah. like to think Welsh should be the biggest sponge out of the lot who's learning um, from, from these older, more established guys. But also, we'll say, well, I started, you know, I played 20 games last season. I started most of the fixtures at the beginning of this season. I've not done a, a heck of a lot wrong. Um, I think there's healthy competition at the back right now, which I'm hoping spurs them all on to, you know, to try and outdo each other and better performances. So right now for me, Cameron Carter Vickers, if you do get the opportunity to bring him in on a permanent basis, I think you'd already be thinking, what's the fee? How much is it? Let's yeah, yeah. talk. I, yeah. I think if anyone can adapt as quickly as he has to to the environment he's in, I think you'd be. I think he already looks to me like someone that would be worth the investment. No, that's fair comment, Russell. Now, Amy, I'm about to go all modern studies essay on you and say two words, but or three words: Bali, Bolingoli, discuss. Fifteen marks, twenty-five marks, <laughs> whatever, whatever you want to give that. Now, you know he threw up. He divided opinion on Saturday, right? My own personal opinion was that he still struggles to play six-yard passes and puts his defence under pressure at time and in opportune times. Other people said that he's the best left back at the club. I would dispute that, but that's just me personally. So where do you stand on it, Amy? Because he's not included in the Europa League squad, so he won't be playing tomorrow against Ferns Faros. No. You know, so yeah. you know, so he's going to come in and out. You know, so it's a uh, this is one that Ange is going to have to deal with delicately, I think. Yeah, it's a tricky one. The fact that you see he's, he's not obviously in the, the Europa League squad, um, so kind of puts cause for concern. I think Montgomery picked up a, a knock in training, so yeah. who starts tomorrow then does it be scales? Um, I don't know. I thought he was okay on Saturday, um, and I wouldn't really push much further than okay. I thought going forward, you know, um, things were things were positive. He always likes to get in and around those areas. I thought his link-up play wasn't actually too bad. But I do worry, you know, defensively. I just think he's sometimes, you know, a half a second um, slow, short, uh, whatever you want to call it, sorry. Um, and I'm just, I don't know, I know a lot of people really, like you say, they really do rate him and think that he is the, the, the best left back at this club. And perhaps that, that could be true. I am still probably more in the, the Greg Taylor camp. I, I'm a big fan of him and I just think he's always came the skateboard. I'm not saying that he is by far the complete player, but if I was to pick between the, the two, I would still be going Taylor. And I like Montgomery. Um, and I'm a big fan of the the youth coming through. I've not even seen skills, you know. But I thought he played he played okay, he played well. Um, but you know, going forward, I, I just don't know. I don't see where he fits into this side. I just think sometimes he's just not switched on enough. I think he leaves gaps, and I think against a better opposition that it could become um, perhaps costly. Russell, Bolland, Bolland, Dolly, discuss. It's, uh, I don't understand. I don't understand the the whole process of how it's going with Ball and Goli. How can you be not deemed worthy of the Europa League squad, but yet two away games now plucked out of obscurity in the first team? Not there's not a process where you're seeing Ball and Goli feature on the bench a few times, and then obviously whatever he's doing in training earns him in the first team. He seems to be, you know, the Livingston game he started, and I'm sure the next match day squad we had domestically. 
he was bottomed out the whole you know, the whole the whole squad. So it's like I don't understand what the thought process is there. I don't understand how someone can go so hot, so cold in the manager's eyes. I find it bizarre. I, I generally think he was his performance on uh, the weekend was overrated. Uh, I, I, I don't I didn't see I didn't see the compelling argument as to go. He's definitely the best left back at the club. I actually find that a wee bit fanciful, if I'm honest to you. Um, there was a moment in the first half, he gets the ball about five, six yards outside Motherwell's box. He's looking to his left. He's positioned his body, directly looking at Jota, and he passes it to Stephen O'Donnell. He's under no pressure. There is no need to do it. I don't understand. It's basics. Um, I don't want to be overly critical of him either. That's a one, that's a one moment thing, but it stuck out to me um, when I was seeing the sort of over praise I felt he was getting or mm-hmm. you know after the match I'm like yeah you can tell we've won a game when ball and goal he's now getting described as the you know the best left back at the club. I don't I don't subscribe to that. I, I don't understand though how we're gonna manage a situation like you were alluding to Amy with regards to if he generally maybe is in that contention in Angie's mind of potentially is the best left back here. If you've not got him in your Europa League squad, then we're gonna have to see a wee bit of you know, we're going to see him coming out the team. We're going to see a bit of rotation in that position and it's going to struggle then for us to have a settled back line. So, he's kind of tied himself up a wee bit in that one, Ange, by not having him in the Europa League squad. I don't know what the shift change has been either in terms of why he now rates him for two away games, which both are high pressure, but yeah, only a matter of weeks before that when naming his Europa League squad didn't feel he was to be included in the 24-man squad. Yeah. That, to me, doesn't add up. Um, and again, as I say, the nature of Ball and Goalie's two selections also baffle me because in between those two uh, first-team starts that he's made, he's also been out the squad when he when he was available completely. So it's a very strange one. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what the answer is. I certainly think, though, we're getting the message that Liam Scales wasn't a, a post call glue sign, and I think that seems very apparent right now. <laughs> Now, something else is baffling as all me. James McCarthy. Curious case of James McCarthy, who was omitted from the first team squad on Saturday altogether. You know, previous, he, to be unkind, you would say injury prone midfielder, but maybe that's doing him a disservice. But handed a four year deal at 30, and Celtic fans not seen a lot of James McCarthy since he came here. You know, does that concern you? Does that worry you? I think it um, was kind of a lot of people's worry, you know, when when that contract was given. I wasn't totally against McCarthy coming in because I thought, you know, a a really, really steady leader with a a vast amount of experience behind him. And at the time, I think it's exactly what we kind of needed. But, you know, the four year, I think that's kind of what what struck everybody because we know what McCarthy, you know, his, his injury past really behind them and it's obviously still still flittering in here but then it's kind of you know it's it's kind of linking back to the previous topic as well though because Ange just does still have quite a, a large injury list you know in front of him and that's why Bongol obviously played yesterday because there, there wasn't really anybody else of course there was scales but you know it was because Montgomery and, and, and Taylor are both out so you know it's, it's pretty when you when you see that that's why it's pretty obvious that Bongol started yesterday but for McCarthy, it is a concern um, because it is, it's that four-year deal. But then that's the same with Ball and Golly. I'm not quite sure of how many more years he's got left on his contract, but it is, um, you know, he, he is a player and he has, has a longer contract. So um, you, you've got the rotation. But McCarthy, there's just so many times a season that we've already went, you know, this is the sort of game for him because that's what we we are led to believe. But if you're going on the basis of actually his Celtic career, you don't really know what is his his type of game because he's not really, you know, been involved in that many. But it's just, it's hard to think as to why that four-year deal was given. I think that's the most curious and perhaps frustrating aspect of it all. Russell, what does the future hold for James McCarthy then at Celtic? What do you see uh, Um, the future being? I think there's there's two sticks that I think James McCarthy is going to be beat with this season. Firstly is his injury record and secondly is a four-year deal that he was given. <laughs> Neither of them reflect what he's been able or unable to do so far on the football pitch. At no point has he started a game 100% match fitness 
with, you know, yep. you know, match sharpness in his legs, whatever you want to call it. You know, when when he, you you went right now, judge him. He's not had the opportunity yet, but yet people are going to start writing him off already. They're going to use the four year contract. They're going to use the fact that he only started twenty EPL games in the last two years. I would like to forget all that baggage that comes with it. Forget the fact it's in a four year deal. What was he meant to do? Say no to it. You know, it's like. And believe me, whether whether it was Post to Coglu who signed James McCarthy in a four year deal, there is a decision making pro uh, decision making process that was used to determine what length of term to give James McCarthy. And I'm gonna hedge a bet that the people that offer James McCarthy tend to know how to make money in, in the world. Mm. They're not going to be just throwing it about willy nilly because he's a Celtic fan or anything like that. So I would like to park all the four year deal injury prone record stuff. I would like to start judging James McCarthy once he is ready to play in the first team. I would like to judge him then once you can see and then if he, if he has a stinker, we'll call it a stinker. But give him the kudos to go. If he's not up to match sharpness yet, he's not up to speed, then to me the jury's very much out, whether it be mid-October or not. And, I, I, you know, I'm loath to to bring up the contract thing. I mean, I, I just feel there's obviously been a reason he was given that length to... It's, um, mm-hmm. We should be glad that he sees the rest of his career at Celtic, pretty much, in essence, you know, and giving him every fair chance when he does get to a level of fitness that he can mm-hmm. play in the first team to see what he can do. And I think Amy's absolutely right. You look at his experience, you look at his track record, you know, uh, you know, if you forget about the injury record, you look at his actual playing career record, he's highly rated. No, I'm a not lot sure. of people no. think he's a, he's yeah. a good player, you know, so... I, I, I'm I'm right now very much going. I've got no judgment to make on James McCarthy as of yet, as he's that opportunity still hasn't arisen yet for him to be. Yeah. A, you know, well, we've not seen enough of him to make any judgment. Exactly. We know the player that he can be and the player that he has been. Mali sixty seven makes the point. He should have been given a year's deal with the option of another if he played games. That's fair enough. I would just like you. I'd like to see him play games. And what's that? Do not do give something. Do not give something. <laughs> Players like McCarthy should always be put on a page you play contract. Well, fair enough. You've alluded to the fact that someone's given him a full year deal, but I would just like to see him play regularly, and as you say, be match fit and up to yep. speed before we make any kind of judgment on him. I, I I totally agree with that. Now, another player who we think perhaps regarding Bollock would have hindered a potential future sale to have been included in the Europa squad. Scott Primo comes in that. That's probably a fair comment as well, Scott. Agree with that. I think Lennon, if they were looking yeah. to sell him, though, if, yeah. sorry, Tony, I think if they were looking to sell him, you know, then that would suggest he was out of Angie's plans anyway. So I when he's brought that. back in from the cold, yeah. particularly the loving He's in because of necessity. Yeah, because Amy's that. right on that. that yeah, she's right that about that. They gave it for a part, but Livingston, it did seem yeah. a strange call. So that, that, I suppose if they were looking to sell him, Scott, yeah. Then it does make it a wee bit more questionable how he was then brought into the first team at Almondville, you know, or the twenty macaroni. Another player who Lila Bada seems to have gone off the boil recently. You know, we we've noticed it in the games gone by, Amy. His effect has not been as it has been in, at the start when he came in and he kinda of hit the ground running. Do you feel that he could maybe do with a spell on the sidelines and if James Forrest is fitter in the next few weeks, bring him back in just so he, ha- he knows he has that kind of competition and but, Forrest snapping his heels and saying I'm ready to take your jersey if you're not performing. You know, Forrest has been a, a massive miss, you know, over the last probably going on the last two, two seasons now, you know, he was a massive omission last year and I don't think, I still don't think it really did get talked about enough, certainly at the time as you know, how big a miss he, he really was um, because in the years previous he just, you know, the work that James Forrest has been doing over the, the past few seasons um, prior to last, uh, well, it was all going, you know, so much under the radar because for so many people, I don't understand why, but he was still kind of the scapegoat that he was, you know, back in like 2014 or what, whatever, sorry, under the original, the, the, the first Lennon days and then, you know, the, the dialing years as well. Um, but I think under, under Rodgers and then into... Lennon's first season back, you know, it was absolutely crucial and the, the goals and the impact and just everything. I just think it was, um, it's always kind of, his importance has always been kind of really underestimated. So I think Abad's dip in form is coming at the worst time for him. 
Um, because when Forrest comes back in, you know, he is really going to have a real competition on his hands. And for me, I would be having Forrest going right back in there. He'll certainly need a few games to get set on up to scratch again. But a, a man of James Forrest's past and what, everything that he's gave to the club, he, he more than deserve it because he is a first-team player in my eyes. Um, we can't talk about how big on a mission he's been. And then for him, when he comes back, I'm not saying he walks right back into the side, but if the player in his position is struggling, then yeah, he's got every chance to have a fair crack of the whip. So for Abada, I think he's going to he's gonna really have to up his game. I mentioned it a few weeks ago, but right now he's almost, he is going to continue playing because there's nobody else really suited to that. Certainly not without having to shift a few guys out of formation, which we certainly do not want to be doing. When Forrest comes back in, it's going to be a, a tough task. And I, I hope it perhaps brings out the best in Abada, you know, that he has to fight for the jersey a little bit. I, I'd love to see that, you know, at 19 years of age. And you just think that's another aspect that of, of development and just kind of just another, you know, um, piece to his armour. That, 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 that's what he's got in him. So it's going to be an exciting time. I'm not too worried right now, um, although the, the dip is, is evident, I think. Um, but you know everybody else is sort of pulling their weight from elsewhere. Um, but and I'm I'm kind of looking forward to seeing James Forrest and, and Anthony Ralston link up as well. For how long we don't know. Obviously Ralston will still be on the side, but that is one that I'd quite like to see. That was my next question, Amy. Just kind of uh, alluded to it there, Russell. How important is Forrest's return to possibly the development of Abada? It could be crucial. That could it kind of help him and see, okay, this is what's needed. This is what required. These are the levels. That have to sustain and maintain to stay in the side. I think you're spot on. I mean, for me, if a bad is wanting to look at an example, then look no further than James Forrest, circa the season 2016 17, and the addition of Paddy Roberts to mm. James Forrest to another level. Because James Forrest realised the pressure was really on for a first team spot and it, and it actually helped him become yeah. a better player and contribute more to the team. And I think with a badder right now, he should be, once he feels Forrest's presence there and pushed him for the first team place, I think he would do a lot worse than looking back at that season and how it inspired Forrest and trying to take note of that and taking a leaf out of that book because as I go back to the defence I was saying about the competition for places, we've got a guy who's just turned 20 years old, the most capped is really under 21 ever, three and a half million pounds. How many goals is an assist has he already contributed this season? Yeah, he has had quite a few quiet games as well. So you think of the contribution this guy's making when he is effective mm -hmm. at such a young age. And I think having that and then mixed with a guy like James Forrest, who's approaching, what, 30, has been around the Celtic first team for a decade. I think he's sitting still on 99 goals, 99 assists. <laughs> I mean, that is brilliant competition for me going forward. It's the, it's the mix of experience and then youthful directness and I, I definitely think we should be in every position this season hoping that that competition is going to stimulate the players and inspire them to do better I think Abada could definitely be doing with some competition right now I think Amy's right I think he's, his performances have tailed off slightly I'm not going to be overly critical of him though because again mm -hmm. if we look back at it and we go imagine that was a Celtic youth player at 20 years old coming yep. through and having done the things that Abada has this season, we'd be raving about them. They'd get a free pass for any quiet games they'd had, rest assured. So, yes, roll on the return of James Forrest. I think it will be good for Abada's development. I think it will also benefit the team because of Forrest's numbers just don't lie. And I, I, I agree with what Amy's saying as well. I think now Forrest is at an age and a level of respect where the scapegoat stuff will probably have stopped for him now as well. Yeah, yeah. He will no longer be that guy. I think I think we're all now grateful for the amount of service that he's given Celtic and his dedication to the club. So I think, yeah, there's a lot to be encouraged by about James James Forrest's return. Ryan Kelly previously said that Abada could learn from Forrest. Totally agree. It's what the, the panel was saying here. And David McMillan was saying, remember Abada's only 20, probably needs yep. a rest. We're sort of alluding to that as well. Once Forrest comes back, you know, so I think there's a kind of consensus there amongst the Celtic supporters about both players that would miss Forrest badly and maybe a badder, you know, he's over 20 and has done a lot since he came in and could maybe do with a spell on the sidelines and knowing that Forrest is there to, to take the jersey, which would be a welcome return. Now, Russell, here's something I don't... I never like talking about referees. You know it's no matter. I know. Thing, 
my MO, my modus operandi, but we have to. There was two referees on Saturday, you know, Willie Collum and then Chris Fordyce, and both of them were just as inept as each other, right? Now, the first one, Motherwell claimed a foul by Kyogo in the lead-up to the first goal. It's fair enough, that's, that, that's perfectly entitled to. Now, Beavis Mugabe's tackle on David Turnbull. Now, we seem to be talking about this every week. There's a shocker and a Celtic player every week, and nothing seems to be getting done. And we keep seeing the same thing. We hope somebody at Celtic is compiling some kind of dossier and listen saying, what's happening here? Now, the only one I can remember getting done was Alan Power at Celtic Park. Yes. I think it was the column that sent him off, wasn't it? Uh, I believe he just wasn't having it. You know, that's the only time this season that uh, a referee has acted. And then also there was the... People kept talking about the bolly handball. Now, I think they sort of, sort of saw that their mother would player had handled it too. And then Bolly handles it and thought, OK, two, play on. two wrongs make a right, play on, let, let's, let's go with that. And I'm sure that's why he did it. I, I'm utterly convinced, you know, but again, just ineptitude. They should see this, shouldn't they? You know, and they should, yeah. they should be making decisions. The, the Mugabe tackle in particular, you know, and the Kyogo's tackle, you could say that was a foul leading up to the goal, but Willie Collin played on, and then you played on in four passes, it's in the back of the net. As we've alluded to earlier, you know, so it, I, I don't know. Only referees can tell you what they're seeing in those situations. But the the crime count in particular and fouls against Celtic players and nasty ones is it's ramping up. I agree totally. I mean, I actually genuinely thought someone had stole Lawrence Connolly's phone <laughs> on Saturday when he messaged the WhatsApp group chat saying he thought it was a good tackle by Mugabe. Wow. Um, we were only talking the week before, or two weeks before, about the Ryan Portier's challenge at Ibrox, yep. whether it was right, whether it's wrong. There is zero consistency. That's what we can be crystal clear on. Um, it does seem like there is an ineptitude, as you, as you allude to, Tony. I think I, I don't like to get caught up in conspiracy theories. It's really not my bag. Yeah. I genuinely think the standard is shocking. Yeah. Uh, and and it, Again, like we were talking, we were talking about this the other week as well. I mean, yeah. about referees going full time would it benefit them? But they're paid too much to do it part time. Yeah. That they can do their day job and get the best part of a grand. I reckon it is probably, or if not more, for each each appearance. Why would you turn that down? You you know why would you want to go into refereeing full time? They're not going to offer much more than that, and then you've lost your other income. So that ain't going to happen. Um, but the only way to improve referees would be the full time route. I just think we've hamstrung, we've completely cornered ourselves by over incentivizing the appearance money for refs. But yeah, it's not the full time job. So they're getting the best of both worlds. Standard was shocking. You know, Colin subbed off injured. Do you think well, things can only get better? I don't know who that referee was. He was awful. Um, I'll, guess, I'll be, I'll be completely honest. Nice right. I'll be completely honest. I thought Kyogo did make a foul in the build up to Celtic's first goal. Takes nothing away from how effective our move was. But it's it right in front of the referee. Away. The referee was right there, wasn't he? So to me, uh, to me, was a close, foul away. Yeah, he was in close proximity, so she'd see it. Aye. You know, and it, it looked like he took the man and then got the ball. I thought Kyogo, and had he pulled it back, I would have had no qualms about it. No. But Celtic did the, the main thing. You know, they just played on and scored. You know, so I, I, I applaud them for that. Of course. Uh, well, well, McMillan comes in. Why are our players not surrounding the ref like other teams do? Well, that's that's up to the players, isn't it? Maybe they've been instructed not to harangue referees. I know Jock Steen and well, Martin O'Neill. Yeah, so yeah, well, um, Jock Steen and Martin O'Neill were big. I never uh, never harangue the ref. I think Brendan Rogers was big in that as well. So, Amy, another inept performance by both guys. Did you see it that way, or you know, the, the standards not great across the board. So. I, I'm not going to say I don't like I don't like blaming referees at all. Um, I find that a really tough subject because I just I just believe that the only way it's going to get better is by making full time. You know, VR is not going to change anything because it's going to be the same guys operating it. And I understand there has been a catalogue that, and there is a catalogue. You, you look at it on Twitter. I think in particular, folk are making their own catalogues um, yes. of instances where, where Celtic players or self decisions have went against Celtic. You know, but I just think you have to look across the standard of the whole of Saturday and you look at how many mistakes were made. You know, it's. Some, somebody's going to mention it. You, you look at that tackle on Aribo. I think it's uh, sorry, the tackle for, by Aribo. Um, 
you look at the inconsistencies across the board, um, I think there was even one, you know, Dundee v Aberdeen, James McPate got sent off. Nobody's really quite sure why James McPate was actually getting sent off in that game. There's just a, a, a lot of inconsistencies and, and poor performances from referees. I Certainly the, the comment that came up, I, I'm, I've got no qualms with that. I, I quite... Um, I take pride that the Celtic players don't hound the referees because you're not supposed to, you know, it should just be the captain um, and, and everybody else is supposed to move away. So in that sense, I'm glad that the players aren't all hounding them. Even if the decision's wrong, that's not the way to go. Um, so so for that, I, I, I do disagree with that comment. But I, I think Roddy Nielsen know, also as well said that he got sent off for questioning something, didn't he? Oh, probably. We player grabbed uh, one of his players' throats and he, and he questioned it and he was subsequently booked for that and then he protested about something else and then he was sent to the stands and he actually never saw the equalising goal. You know, I, I think referees are very quick to send managers to the stand when they mm-hmm. when they shout and swear and, and go mental about a particular decision or question it, certainly. You know, and, they, and they're pretty trigger happy to just go to the stand, but they're not as trigger happy when they're dealing with players, in my opinion. You know, Ryan Kelly comes in, Tom Boyd summed that challenge up well, during commentary of Saturday's game, our players are definitely needing more protection. I mean, I, I'm never, I, I'm always fairness. That's all. You want referee to the same standard, and as you pointed out, Russell, it's the glaring inconsistencies that you see every other week. Amy's mentioned Joe Aribo's tackle. <laughs> I mean, you, unpunished. You've seen similar tackles be punished. So what? Somebody has to explain the difference. You know, and the, the retrospective reds and all that, I mean, I, I always think that they're a nonsense because they have no effect on the outcome of the game, right? Spot the on. game has been played, right? You can issue all the retrospective punishments all you want, deal with it at the time, you know, and have punish players. And I mean Celtic players as well, you know. I want consistency across the board. But I was just highlighting it on Saturday because it was another challenge by McGabby on Turnbull that, I felt was pretty dubious and, and maybe warranted a red card. You know, and should have warranted a red card, yet nothing happened. There was no card. And the Hardys I get back to on Callum McGregor in the opening day of the season, which I, I still watch and think, in front of the referee, how can, he, how can he give nothing? No card. You know, it could have been a leg breaker or a, a career ender. You know, and I'm not picking on these. I'm, we're talking about games because we watch Celtic games every week. So you're talking about incidents that you see, you know, Powers was rightfully dealt with, you know, and, and like Amy, I, I'm always uncomfortable talking about referees because I'm not a big conspiracy theorist. I just want them to do their job right and consistently. And I get to err as human. I get all that, but they're erring every other week and glaringly so, in my opinion. Yeah. You know? I think it's important as well that we're, we're talking about this in the back of a win. So there's no, you know, issue with sour grapes here or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? We're highlighting it. Mm-hmm. We're going to highlight it as well throughout the season when glaring errors are made. And that is going to be win, lose or draw. I would like to think we'll be consistent in that regard as well. Because well, we've already, we've already said Kyogo filled in the lead up to the goal. Yep. I thought Moral had a clear case. Uh, you know, they had a clear case. You know, yep. so, uh, and it happened right in front of them. So what did he not see there? You know, so yep. I... I I'll, I'll counter it with that. You know, that I did think it was a foul. But as I say, Celtic never hung about to question any decision that was coming. Bang up the park, scored. You know, so, no. and, and took control of the game. So, but yeah, Amy, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I hate talking about referees because I, I prefer to talk about football, but they're making it harder every week, aren't they? By making mistakes. We all know that referees are a necessity for our, for our game to go on, so we all want them to be better across the board. There's no denying that. So it's more just frustration because you just wish that you know something would change because then we could at least see you know it does go on full time doesn't make a difference because a difference does have to be made and it's not you know I know you're going to get you're going to get the the narrative that you know it's. It's, it's moaning Celtic fans, conspiracies, wh- whatever you want, um, and you know that if you're you're too strung up on on other things, but th- there's week in week out, and and you know you're kind of spot on. I, I do believe that it is a foul from from Kyogo as well, and if the referee blew it, then you know 
yeah. I, I like you, I would have no qualms about it, but I just think we have to all be honest and say that, you know, the, the standard isn't good enough across the board. And then I would make conspiracies, because I'm not, I don't like that word either, but yeah. it just has to be truthful uh, across the whole spectrum of Scottish football, because I think, you know, there's going to be so many other sets of fans are going to be sitting here going, you know, I think that there's a conspiracy against us or there's a conspiracy against us. Um, but we do have to keep t- talking about it. I know we don't like talking about it and don't want to talk about it, but somebody has to talk about it because it's the yeah, only way that it really it, it? Yeah. 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 Sorry, cut you off there and what were you going to say? No, no yeah, absolutely. That's it. Yeah. Right, we'll look ahead to tomorrow. Ferran Schwarz, Friday. Or Kevin McCluskey, who appears now and again, our Hungarian football expert, you would sum them up by saying that they're maybe no very good. You know, but uh, I don't think Celtic can underestimate any European challenge coming their way because we've come a cropper in the past to teams like Ferns Faros. So you just hope that Celtic can get a wee push and get their first win in the in the group, Russell, and uh, take it from there, really, isn't it? Give themselves a wee platform to you know, attack the other three that are left after this one? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. We take nothing for granted in Europe, Tony. But I also want to have a level of expectancy that I associate with Celtic to be. Yeah. You know, let's beat Ferenc Varos at home in the Europa League. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not, not saying it's a walkover or the, the job's already done, but I would like to think we can rate ourselves as having an expectancy of ourselves to beat teams like this. Yeah. And I, 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 as I've said last week, I mean, I'm just a wee bit concerned that as this season of transition or whatever people are calling it, is, it goes on, expectancy levels carries on dropping to make excuses. I'm not for that. I want to see us beat Ferenc Varos at home comfortably on Tuesday. I think Celtic standing in the game should allow us to do that. I think we have enough players. I think we have, we have quality internationals throughout the team. We were talking earlier about competition for places hotting up again. I... Why not beat Ferenc Varos in the Europa League? Like, I, I, that's the attitude. It's not been ignorant about Friday because yeah. I was lucky enough to have a great chat with Kev all about them last week and I took on board all the points he made. I know how seriously they're taking tomorrow because they rested three or four players yesterday or, or on Saturday in the league. Um, and I think they came a cropper. They actually lost. But the one good thing I think about these matches is the Europa League is not a level that is above Celtic. Mm-hmm. And this is a level we should be competing in, not appearing in, competing, not yeah. appearing. And that's, you know, when I've seen, I've seen comments coming in, people saying, you know, you take third right now and drop into the conference league. No, no, I don't agree with that at all. I, I, I think that should be your safety net if things don't go yeah. well. Not, yeah. not, not something to be honing in on as, well, forget third, we'll get this. Let's go get a result out of the ordinary. And why should it be out of the ordinary to be beating teams like Ferenc Varos home and away to maybe nick a point in Germany and get a... You know, we beat Lazio only a couple of years ago on their own turf. I, I, I worry about people's expectancy levels dropping as they continue to mollycoddle a season of transition. You know, the reality is Celtic spend more than enough. Good to see you back in the light there, Amy. Um, <laughs> it's like months getting a bit dark in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, I just think that the Champions League thing over the last decade, Tony, we've slowly but surely subconsciously been writing off and yeah. it's became this wee bonus ball for us. Please do not let the Europa League start becoming that exact same thing. We have to be going ahead of matches like Ferenc Farris at home and saying, yes, Tony, I think we will win that match. That was a bit of a rip-roaring, free-scoring, never-boring speech there from Russell, Amy. Yes, Cameron Robertson agreed, Russell. Now I'm going to throw this one. That I'll save the hardest one for you, Amy. Who plays left-back against Ferns Farros? Mm-hmm. That's very unfair of me to throw that in your court, isn't it? But what do you think? Think for Liam Scales to, to step up to the plate, do you think? you think the manager might, might go with that? Um, I'm trying to think who else you know could be if Montgomery's back. Then obviously you'll be you'll be um, hoping that it's him. I, I knew somebody was going to say that. I was thinking a comment was going to come in. Please no, please no. Um, yeah, I'm trying to to rack my brain. Otherwise, and I, I can't think. You know why you would you know shift any of the, you you wouldn't shift Starfield yeah. or or Cameron mm-hmm. Carter Vickers. You want that stability there. So yeah, I think you would need to 
probably give, give it to Scales on, on this one, which is a bit of a worry then because as much as we're just saying, you know, it makes sense for Ball and Golly to have been playing at the weekend, if Montgomery's injury looks to be going past and, and effective off tomorrow, then you would have liked to have thought that then Scales would have got a little opportunity on on um, on Saturday there to find his feet, get a little bit of match fitness, also get used to yeah. that back line. And and for me, that would have been the, the way to go about it. So I think it has to be Scales. And as much as I'll be looking forward to that, I be a little bit worried because I would think then why was he not playing on Saturday? Yeah, yeah. I agree with that 100%, Amy. I think Amy's bang on the money there, I think. Yeah. We know Scales did a lot of travelling with Ireland and apparently Celtic weren't very happy because he wasn't utilised at all, even in the match day squads. But what you would say is if he's going to be used tomorrow, surely a sub-appearance 10, 20 minutes or whatever at the very yeah. least yeah. would have been necessary because that is then going to look like... I ignore you know, the pun, but a left field inclusion if Liam Scales now starts, which is unfair on him, you know. But, uh, but I, I completely subscribe to what Amy just said there. I think Scales had to get minutes at the week, the weekend if you're going to justify his inclusion on Tuesday. And I, I worry about that. I wonder if Montgomery maybe... Do we know much about his injury status? Because no. I think it was a bit of a curveball. He wasn't in the squad at first, and we were kind of in the WhatsApp group chat frantically trying to find out what Montgomery's status was, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah. Well, Facebook user comes in and says the Hungarians are not a bad team. I do think we should beat them, but not easily. That's fair yeah. enough. Yeah, I mean, that's... I that's agree with that. You said that, yeah. I mean, every European ties a test for Celtic, you know, so we're, we're not underestimating the Hungarians at all. No. You're saying that we have a squad of players now who are competing for places and are now beginning to find some kind of level, a consistent level. Even Mullen sees this game might be too big for skills. Well, we'll only, we'll only find out one way, David, if the manager picks his in. You know, so uh, another one that we've not seen too much of, and he had played European football, hadn't he, before he came to Celtic yes. and scored a belter and was looking every inch the part. So, no, I wouldn't be too worried if. And threw another curveball in there and included them, to be honest. And said Monty should be fit for tomorrow. Well, really, Monty's fit for tomorrow. Then he'll uh, he will start with Monty. Then won't he? You know, so that, that's fair enough. But we'll end the show as I alluded to at the, sh- at the top of the program. The three awards, guys. And for those of you who didn't know, Axon won the best international podcast and the best international club content creator. And we were third in the best charitable campaign. Two goals and a bronze down in London, the Royal Lancaster Hotel. And just to give you an idea of the, the kind of opposition we were up against, AC Milan, Brazil, Barca, Siempre Positivo, Football Aranja, MLS UK Show, On the Continent Football Ramble, Open Goal, Spanish Football Podcast, Talk Scottish Football and the State of Play. That's who we were up against in the best international category. Now, we, whilst we are delighted, we have to turn around and say we can't do it without the subscribers and the listeners and people that hit the subscribe button, you guys. And we do what we do for you and we, we hope you enjoy the content. You clearly enjoy the content because you've put us to the pinnacle of football podcasting uh, in, well, in this country and in Europe, basically. And we got the best club content creator, interna- international club content creator. And again, we were up against AC Milan, Brazil, Algerian football, football Aranja, football twice, Stas, Giri Cast, Melbourne Citizen, Milan Weekly Podcast, Ranks FC and Sempre Milan. Now, they were quite heavyweight podcast. As I say, it's 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 humbling. And I just wanted also to say the, the amount of people who watch the programme and subscribe who have got in touch with various members of Axom we thank you from the bottom of our heart because it is truly humbling and all the lovely messages and responses. We we try and get back to you individually, but it might take until the next award ceremony come down <laughs> for that to happen because there was so many well-wishers. And honestly, uh, your support genuinely means the world to us and we thank you for it, all right? And on that positive cheery note, we shall end the broadcast and also two away wins in a spin. Come on. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. Cheers, Amy. Cheers, Russell.